Poetry Open Mic here on Facebook and the author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry. I also have been so honored to be here as your Pride Parade Grand Marshal. I am coming to you live from Olympia, Washington, which is on the unceded territory of the Coastal Salish and Squaxin peoples. And folks, last hour I lost my remarks and so my apologies um, for not bringing everything into the room that I had hoped to lift all the time. I wanna thank our co-sponsor, Headmistress Press. And thanks to Don Krieger and Elizabeth Ann, happens to be my sister, as some of you know, for just really great Zoom support today. Um, we've waited to go to Zoom for many weeks and I think we found a very, very good home for our live open mic moving on into our 14th week since the pandemic. Well, in the early hours of June 28th, 1969, the New York Police Department raided the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village. This event launched the modern movement for LGBT rights with the first official gay pride parade following a year later in New York City, Los Angeles, and Chicago on this day, June 28th, 1970. The next year, 1971, Pride went global and remains with us today, as strong as ever. In solidarity with the current Black Lives Matter movement and in celebration of the recent US Supreme Court decision, extending further employment protection for LGBTQ plus peoples, welcome to our celebration and our commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Pride. After our featured readers, we will end the parade with a live open mic hosted by spoken word writer, performer, Andy Talbot from Newcastle, UK. That's coming up in our next hour. On our Cultivating Voices Live group page, we have all our readers' bios with links to their websites and presses. Please support them in the presses that support them and also support you by purchasing at least one book today. Also, we have a list of organizations doing exceptional work in their intersectional ways. And we'd love it if you'd show your appreciation for all these readers today that have joined us. And rather than a tip jar, make a donation in any amount to any of these organizations. We're at a parade. It's great weather wherever you're at. And um, feel free to use the chat, show your appreciation. The live video will transform into a video that resides on our group page where readers are going to be able to see your love. Happy Pride to all of you. Let's meet our paraders for our third hour. We have today at first up in the hour, Riley T. McCutcheon, a hybrid writer, interdisciplinary performer, community educator, and a 2018 Lambda Fellow in Poetry. Their work has appeared in Foglifter, Papachu Review, and Matt Brute. Riley earned a dual degree MFA in Creative Nonfiction and Poetry from Antioch University, Los Angeles, and teaches writing at Seattle's Hugo House. Their debut poetry collection, my Ugly and Other Love Snarls was published in 2017 by University of Hell Press. Riley resides in the unceded Coastal Salish territories where they cast spells in text and flesh and sweat. And again, a shout out, Riley has helped bring the voices uh, of our readers together today. Thank you so much, Riley, for supporting me in gathering our group today. Next, we have Alyssa Moore. Alyssa is a black, queer, multidisciplinary artist based in Chicago. So glad to have the Windy City with us today. Her work has appeared in Pulp Mouth, Tagverk, Hyperallergic, Bennington Review, 
poetry, and elsewhere. Mark Ward is the author of the chapbook Circumference from Finishing Line Press in 2018 and Carcass from Seven Kitchens Press to 2020. A full-length collection is forthcoming from Salmon Poetry in 2022. That's a lot of twos. Mark is the founding editor of Impossible Archetype, an international journal of LGBTQ poetry now in its fourth year. Ananya Garg is an Indian lesbian poet and educator. Ananya's film, Mango, produced in collaboration with poet Vico Naylor, was screened at the Cadence Video Poetry Festival. This March, she went on tour with Radar Productions' Sister Spit Tour. Support Ananya by purchasing her chapbook, Stillness, or stickers. I can't wait to get stickers. Thank you for bringing stickers to the parade. The stickers are Ananya's original art, and please check the bio for how to support the artistry. And our final reader in our featured readers today is Miriam Bazid. Miriam is a non-binary Egyptian immigrant writer, performer, and cook living in a rent-stabilized apartment in Brooklyn. An alliteration-leaning writer of prose, poetry, plays, and personal essays, M received an MFA in fiction from Hunter College in 2018. To procrastinate from facing the blank page, Miriam curates and runs a monthly-ish world music salon and open mic in Brooklyn and is a slow student of Arabic music. In unrelated news, M is very much looking forward to such time as when queer people can dance up on each other again. I like your style, M. Here's to the third hour of our parade. Enjoy, folks. We'll see you next hour for our open mic. And up right now, Riley T. McCutcheon. Hello. Um, before I get started, I just want to thank all of the people that are here, and in particular, the people that I invited and asked to come. Um, it's really lovely. Thank you for trusting me, this space, and Sandy, and for bringing your incredible presence and words. Um, it's been a total delight. Um, and kind of in the spirit of uh, thinking about others, I want to open my reading uh, with a piece that's dedicated to the first person that I came out to as, as trans. Um, we kind of hatched together. Um, so this piece is called L. I gobble down her bookshelf, tender as any sex, stick fingers through pages. I have this vision. We go to a queer dreamland. Breasted hijinks ensue. I could tell that that is where she most liked being touched. How lung released from lips as I gripped and too much. And weak knees return, eyelids boiling, sky, ward, heart, bent, red gush, fingers up voice box. I might give out just thinking about when leaned against kitchen table, I, read, I readied the shivers and buckled under red table that met both our hips exactly where we split the echoes of her refrigerator. There was nothing left over. Our legs went all the way up. When she buckled, I lifted, moved fast, strong like alligator. I know exactly how much I can hold. A small constellation of freckles on legs, shimmered, sharp, pushing up skirt, olive tights with the stirrup keeping steady. Our rhythm shimmered, fist in hair, contact, tugging, neckline, happily. I noticed how we noticed each other. Uh, 
I'm going to go and, and share a screen for a second because there's a secret message in this next poem uh, that I think hopefully some, some people in, in this group will enjoy. It's called Rebirth Right, a thesis. It is our rebirth right to fuck in every single stall John that's been misnamed family. We all become family when we fuck because fucking isn't fucking unless it's pleasure and queer pleasure is never solitary. Queer pleasure is instant spiritual solidarity with ancestors, the ones who came before and are still pleasing themselves under the heavy veil of history, whose tragedy is merely the antimatter of our universe, our non-binary timeline, expanding, holding, tension, and release. We go where we please. Okay, I switched this piece out with another piece um, because of Charlie, because I, want, I wanted Charlie to have this poem. What if the moon was an uncircumcised dick? What if the moon was an uncircumcised dick? Emerging, retracting, 29.53 sunrises along the sun, a bright clitoris, eclipsed shadow snakes writhing. You do not sword fight with the sun. You tiny cock interlock, sharp, bright, match head striking, match head. Do not address such bright directly. One lick would consume all your blue. The ocean is always hungering after smooth stone skycock, sun shadow falling, crescent, crescent, foreskin, gibbous. What if the moon was an uncircumcised dick? What if it were my dick? What if I chopped it down 2,000 years ago to stop global warming? What if I just now got around to growing a new one? What if the rising oceans are all my fault, are being drawn up by my second dick growing ever bigger? Because I, second mouth, smile the sky too full, too whole, too wide, too holy. They pulled out my wisdom teeth too, except for the one too wise and dangerous to remove. So I must find other cocks to wax wing the empty wisdom spaces with temporarily. What if the breasts that so many call mountains weren't actually indicative of fertile soil beneath? The breasts hold and manipulate rain for their own reasons. It is nice to feel wet from time to time. Just because the moon is our cock doesn't mean that the ocean is a lady. The ocean is not a lady. We call her she because man is something more obviously too small. If your breasts are made granite, cast granite, who in their right mind would assign you sedimentary or assume that your name the one you were given is more important than the fires that made you uncircumcised dick. What if the moon exists? Okay, this piece is called First Stone and it's very recent, so I feel kind of tender about it. Um, The sky sitting on my chest. The grasses in my lungs. My thighs hurt like the earth. Every stone is the first stone when it comes to casting clavicle, undance, fascia without fashioning, salt foot spider candy. Peel back 
your patterns before transformation. Nobody warns you how exhausting it is to be new. Molecule, preceding music. I didn't have to react. Your body is already bursting with permission. All right, I have one more piece. Um, and this is a piece that I read differently in different contexts. Um, if I'm in a, a context where I feel in community, um, I read it uh, second, I, I read it we, um, but if I'm not in community, I read it as an I. Um, and it's just, yeah, I love, it's, it's what I read to myself when I feel like I don't deserve to exist. But we all deserve to exist. So hopefully these things, some of these things might be true for you too. Contents. We contain multiplication tables. We contain water tables. We contain water chestnuts. We contain a waterfall of chest. We contain 42 moons. We contain seven times six is. We contain the oceans constricting. We contain tidefuls of fish. We contain the algorithm, the melody. We contain the smooth stone talk. We contain flirtatious waves, vicious undertow. We contain skates and rays. We contain many more teeth than bones. We contain magic and matter, 99% nothing at all. We contain white space, the big bang left us over. We contain un mass, uncontrasted. We contain fluids mucous membranes, all that is disgusting, divine, tantalizing. We contain many breaches. We contain the belly of a whale. We contain distress intestinal. We contain woods and winds. We contain sharps and flats. We contain hashtags and stilettos. We contain portraits and landscapes. We contain maps, globes, atlases, content, con continents drawn disproportionately. We contain where there be monsters. We contain jungles of trauma. We contain the freshness we can remember and the ruptures we were made to forget. We contain the formula for recovery. We contain capacity to heal. We contain patience. We contain principles of uncertainty. We contain postulates theorems thick enough to swim through. We contain ash, the seeming motionlessness of this earth. We contain sprained ankles, crutches in the pouring rain. We contain heavy burdens and whimsy. We contain joint smoke. We contain joint pain. We contain a bowl full of cherries. We contain fingertips and dark pits, we contain spit, we contain humor, we contain vitriol, we contain sight, we contain undocumented senses, we contain pots boiling over, we contain the heat and homogenizing force of written history, we contain the waiting, the unwritten, the never, we are, we contain already the wisdom in the lessons we are learning and unlearning. We contain negotiation. We contain all that has passed and is passing. We contain new years. We contain old ears. We contain all of the sins that we borrowed. We contain all of the blue in the universe. Thank you. All right, hello. That was amazing, Riley. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and thank you to all the organizers and everyone who has brought so much amazing queer energy here today. Um, I'm like, so excited to read and be here with all of you. Uh, so for most of the reading, I'm going to be sharing my screen, but I'm just gonna start off with uh, a poem called 
how I learned to stop worrying and fuck the effacement. I'm like a bird on a tarot card. Everyone has got something to say about what I might mean. Tricks on them. Even on a good day, I can only be read two ways. On a good day, I'm two geese on a cardboard quadrilateral flying nowhere, read suspended over an earth that you will never illustrate. I'm like a 2D bird, rainbows laced through all my wings for decorum. Pay attention, was squeamish, now getting stronger. I hate birds. I'm Branta canadensis. I'm dentist to your dumb cavities, i.e. not yours. I'm like, I just made it for life and I'd rather not. I'm like, stop looking at me to tell you what you are. I'm like two birds with 18 square inches of wiggle room. I only fly one way that you can tell. Had a designer and then deigned to live life on my own. Today, I ate a tarot card. It satisfied a hunger I didn't have yet. Even on a bad day, could generate a meaning that'll be accepted into the canon. I fire away, fly right through your faux flow splendor, rainbow road. I'm like 12 birds in a corrugated enclosure. Of course you want me. Of course you want me. Of course you want to pick me up. I'm slick with sunshine and I know it. My plumage is pluripotent. My existence is the rarest strain of meaning. I know exactly who you are and I don't care. I'm like 50 birds on a tarot card. I lied about my limited meanings. I'm a complex goose and a complex goose has a right to keep some things to herself. Okay, now I'm gonna share my screen. I have uh, some poems that are from this collection of, let's see, um, a collection of these like digital, um, let's see, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, a, co a collection of like digital, full screen mode, um, collages. So I'm gonna share a few of them. And I wanted to make sure everyone could see what I was reading. Everyone was going everywhere and I was the culprit. My black pussy and I regenerate the moment a bad copy further proof of my purpose. I started Goliath revisions to current affairs. Aretha Franklin, I was the superstar. Personal achievement one. Just wanted to stay alive and that was the lowest hurdle. I thought I was, was what was wrong with America and that hurdle levitated. Catch me in a park, catch me outside, no really, catch me, I'm pure cash, been currency for centuries and all I know of myself is the present, the gift of life, move, I've got to thank someone for it. American therapy informs me, the problem is I'm tending a jealousy, but I've got dead daffodils occupying my workspace and ants colonizing my rug, so possession can't be my issue. My issue. I'm black and I know I better be at work. Watch me seduce linear time. I'm reusable, washable, ringable. You can ring me. I'm not the operator. You can get real close as I dig up palatable costumes at the thrift store. I'll apologize as you take your hands down the contours of my dressing room. Strategic positioning has kept me alive. I give something up so we can reside. Let me pair a runny nose with my battered silver pumps and your bastard rich dad's bobbed haircut. So what? I'm complicit. I'm with it, strutting in my brief skin with my, can someone pay me for this? At the intersection, I fumble a dulled, clean love, a symmetrical paranoia in my pocket, a plot of land, a perpetual crossroads, a laundromat in which I change my coins into fewer coins, a laundromat in which my neighbor tells me not to trust my intuition. Okay, maybe she didn't say it to my face. Am I on trial and am I the error and the American machine? I grew up healthy, perks of being born in the most efficient century, socialized, docile, no bite. I gave up something I'm still registering. All my sisters were flexing and all the boys just wanted to have their babies. I don't know this, didn't know this yet, but I knew I was alone. 
in science class at the bench at the fume hood, my peers peered over their Bunsen burners dramatically, their strikers poised for chaos, but my teacher only had eyes for me. She pocketed the flocculence. I was left with the magnifying glass. She only let me examine one bug at a time. Okay, moving on. Literally Isa. Not lost on me, the caged mastiff groaning in the other room as in the bathroom, I rearrange the party face, default and air dry, etc. I know I've been changed. Back in the summer of 17, I was reduced to meaning not above open presentations of my pain, free gallery hours, lengthy discussions, exhibitions, and the like. I say reduced, but it was distilled, refined, made into the most potent proof in preaching to a sandbox of one what I would not stand for. But this is Iowa, and I will stand for anything, many things at the same time, mostly an undisturbed stream of pleasure for such have totally abandoned and majestic routes and contrivances. In Walker, Iowa, there was a car headed, a cow headed for the car, and now I know the meaning of lumber. Before this bathroom, there was just an outhouse. Before the outhouse, there was a hole in the ground. There was nothing before the hole in the ground. This is an obvious retrograde of thought, and outside of it, a small party with one openly racist invitee, and the rest channeling it through excessive questions regarding my current labor, if I labor. No one understands what I am doing, but everyone knows someone who is doing something similar and better. Okay, just got two more poems. Um, when I say it, it sounds like really mediocre, but it really works when you say it. I started dating a tape recorder because I was certifiably dehydrated, the plastic fetish, and everything in me said, why the hell not? It must be noted that I did not at that time believe in hell. At that time, made equally woozy by crimson leaves and cockroaches, you could say I lacked a certain distinction. The tape recorder was preoccupied with integrity. I attempted the posture of supportive lover, pointing out the ambient noise and staticky feedback of the recordings. The recorder responded by putting itself in increasingly perilous situations, at one point infiltrating the mob, interviews with murderers and their victims. One could not fault its ambition. In the middle of our relationship, I was perusing a blank sidewalk and picked up a pencil. I was feeling retroactive. I slept with the pencil in my pocket. It could be said that I moved the pencil, but also note how the pencil moved me to unique orthographic expression, taken to recording only when paper was near. I felt so analog, like a primal part of me creaking back open. At this time, I was living with the tape recorder. There were blank tapes stuffed into the sink and the tub, propping up the bed frame. All the work to be done, the tape recorder kept repeating, but by then I was already snipping mechanical pencils from the catalogs waist deep in my vision board. All right, this is the last one. Dee says he calls the men babe. I haven't finished anything this week. I do crosswords and he does sex work in the next room. X calls me babe and I imagine myself a rug swallowing a new body, itchy with my own meaning and disuse. I sit before a blackboard of willful ignorance. don't fit that. It is hard to be accommodating and grimy afterwards. D calls me babe. Afterward, X calls me. I wake up to D talking in the bathroom. It's my lack of clarity. The counter is littered with mascara. Foundation stains up the bathroom sink. It's not the men. It's a friend from college. It's a bus pulling out with difficult knowledge. I did the whole parade in D's worn pink wedges. X curls back into the phone. X says, never mind. X says, why? I wanted to be loved like an 18-wheeler. Are all the smoke detectors down? 
You need only plunge your hand in to feel it. D says D, D says he is not attracted to them. I am the best rug. I wanted to feel it in the parking lot, in the shower park, back of the cab, contextual highway, the ball pit. All right, thank you guys. Hello, uh, my name is Mark. Um, I presume everyone can hear me. Um, I'm just gonna read. Um, so the first poem is called A Poem for Actors and it's after John Wieners. The room is filled with light. Our bodies heaving with air. We are present in a way no one understands the lives we flee from. Documenting impermanence is a form of strength. This palmed love is codified among the slats where we distill into performance. The lines alive, transformed in utterance from the author's burden, the audience's expectation. What this means is our translucence, the utter destruction of days. For this is what we are made for. That moment of disappearance where we are done with pretending we are not the dawn, backlighting the empty stage the applause. Now we are your disbelief, your pause at our encroaching night. Um, next one is called Urge and it's a villanelle about BDSM. A smack, a slap across my skin, akin to crime you partake in, the canvas molds his own beating. By controlling the precision and how frequent each collision, a smack, a slap across my skin. My tacit stare regulating this edge in which we dabble in, the canvas molds zone beating. Smiling, savouring the feeling, the sensation we're creating, a smack, a slap across my skin stops time and space and narrowing down to the sound of your own breathing. The canvas molds zone beating submitting to his ransacking. The world almost whirls out of control, but each smack, each slap reins it back in. The canvas molds his own beating. Um, next poem is uh, one of my favorites. It's from the upcoming Salmon Collection, Nightlight, and it's called Turkish Bath. Under the railway arches, a queer London imitation with its own elliptical rituals. The silent bartering for free residuals. You're one of the contactables, as Armistead once said. Our groin and ass conjoining the fiction that skin spins. Our rhythms supersede the heavy gravity outside. Each touch is a spotlight throwing the rest of the world in darkness. The seam is, the seam is set dressing. Burying the cold sweat of your situation, we chat about our impending dissolution into strangers' lives. You ladle water over stones and disappear in their encroaching hiss. I rinse, you shower thoroughly, a surgeon blanching his skin, a guzzle, you correct me, a ritual you couldn't possibly. You tell off, leaving me felled with no hot water. Um, this next poem is based on a true news story and it's called How to Get a Head in Advertising and it's preceded by a quote. I was partying at a club and I took, I took a Viagra before I went. I met a nurse whom I went home with who ended up injecting an erection enhancer into my cock. I thought, why not? What could possibly go wrong? From a gay man hospitalized with an erection that may never go down, pink news. Did you need the Viagra to achieve a euphemism, a uh, woody, uh, stiffy, all, at most almost a priapism, to feel it throb beyond its impression like animism, the pole and soul reanimated into formalism? The nurse, too used to bodily whims, proffers altruism as a needle. He smirks, just ensuring your magnetism. You wanted its absence to be the same, to be the cause of nihilism and all who gazed up at this edifice of hedonism, but then, he comes, no longer interested in organisms or organs and their isms. Your cock is a malapropism that you try to tie down with a loose loop of ribbons. All night it clings to life and you pray for an exorcism. 
divine intervention to wake up without this barbarism. Your cock views you as a parasite and in its egotism wishes for its freedom using shooting pains and schisms. Uh, this next poem is for uh, Irish poet Nell Regan and it's called Gown. A reverse straitjacket, not designed to close, no matter how hard I try to tie the fabric strips, I'm exposed. I pull my hoodie over hospital clothes. I sit in the corridor. My shins are cold. I worry that someone could see what, up what feels like a dress that barely reaches my knees. I have decorated myself for cabaret, perfected little Edie Bouvier, lip synced my way through all the best parts. Each array of makeup allows a fresh start. I feel unsafe as I wait for the ultrasound. I watch myself pull down the hem, zip up my hoodie, cross my thighs so no one could see what. My bare legs, my discomfort that for a moment I felt like a boy in a dress, and that for a moment I allowed myself to feel less. Um, this next poem is unpleasant, but it's, the world is at times and this is still going on. Um, it's preceded by a quote from Tell Road from 2019, um, and the headline was, Ugandan authorities administer anal exams on 16 LGBTQ activists arrested on suspicion of gay sex, punishable by life imprisonment. This is called Exam. I feel his fingers pull me apart. I am on all fours on a steel trolley somewhere underground in town. All I can see is feet passing. I clench. He smacks my arse and for a moment I am at home with you, this easy intimacy before bed. Fingers always hurt the nails, even through gloves, that illusion of hygiene. He opens me to peer inside. He rummages, searching for sedition or semen, something to prove I walk around with sinful innards. I make no sound. And when he is done, despite telling me that I can dress, I remain. Trousers around my ankles without shame, fully aware of my unprovable proficiencies until he leaves in disgust. Um, this next poem is uh, the opening poem from Nightlight. I had another poem in its place and everybody that read the book in advance went no 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 you have to open with this one so open it with a bang so to speak um this is called bear the only light comes from the distended television tinted with red on heavy rotation lighting up limbs play fighting riding themselves into well-oiled hinges i watch your body reform shivering at cold spunk Aware of your breath's hardness at my stare, you have become rudderless in your quest to become nothing. The world is a windowless tomorrow holding steady on the brink of sunlight. Fucked raw against the wall, there is a hush. Even your tinnitus is quiet now. You're a skin flick burnt into the TV, perpetually left pre-coming on mute. So I have two more. Um, this one was uh, in Poetry Island Review, and it's called Public Displays of Affection, and it's dedicated to my nephew, Saul Ward, who named uh, his first band after a line in this poem. Today, kissing is a competition, a sloppy act of composition, a brush of lips is intermission as political tract. I watch them instinctively act upon their biological fact, their sexuality as ruling pact as walking exposition. Hand in hand, each story's transcription into shared history occurs by validation. Eyes fix upon their smug radiation, they glance to their audience, wrapped. Each performance whispers of subscription since Monopoly stay so with repetition. Each grazing tongue staves off depletion is another way to distract from those unwilling to follow instruction and uncover the mysteries of opposition to different bodies designed for collision for maximum impact. 
their bodies, like an action movie, an abstract, reduced to insertion, condensed to contract, abbreviated at a context as a pornographic act, like the way they see my life. As an act of attrition, decaying my willpower by building partitions, saying what I can do, what's up for discussion, what's acceptable in public, what causes a revulsion, and how to live when life subtracts. The man and woman stop and kiss. I overreact. They're holding up the cue. I turn away and redact their kiss, their happy bliss. Life moves on intact, but I feel like my mouth is close to sedition. However, you don't like public displays of affection. You smile softly at my silent act of volition to write this poem and end it with us, eyes closed, kissing as protest, as an expression of love, as something matter of fact. The last poem is very short, so before I go, I just want to say happy, happy Pride and thank you to Sandy and everybody involved for putting together this wonderful evening and thank you for inviting me. Um, to end, I thought I would end with a very short poem about cocksucking. Sword Swallower. The strong man prepares to take the vault of the world. If you breathe, you can achieve anything. A whole new throat. Thanks, everybody. Hey, y'all. Uh, my name's Ananya. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I'm so excited to be here. Thank you to the organizers of this event. Um, thank you to my fellow poets who are performing and sharing their words today. And thank you specifically to Riley for inviting me into this space. I really appreciate you. Um, yeah, um, there's a lot happening in the world right now, and I'm really glad that we're making this space for queer joy during Pride weekend, during Pride month. Um, and I also want to uplift the movement that's happening right now in Seattle and the community's demands to defund the police, to reallocate those funds into um, community organizations and education and community spaces, and finally to free political prisoners, to free the protesters in Seattle. Um, also resign Jenny Durkin, you're trash. <laughs> so here's my first poem. It's all about um, thinking about my queer ancestors. I am a Indian lesbian and I think a lot about the other queer South Asian people that were happy and lived together in communities and also whose lives were erased. Um, because of the violence of colonialism. So this is called To the Forgotten Colored Scarves. My dearest, my dearest unknown, to those who must have smiled as bright as I do, who must have laughed loud and loved deep, I know you sat cross-legged shared the food you taught each other to make, fanned the sweat from each other's foreheads as you braided each other's hair and put flowers in the spaces left empty. You must have worn the brightest scarves. I can see you now, running, flying, past the dull grays and lighting everything ablaze. Tell me, how were you so bright? so brilliant and still left forgotten tell me how did i learn of elders and not of you thank you um i'm reading from my chapbook stillness which i published um, in anticipation of going on tour um, and I, i'd love if you guys could support me um, and venmo me at ananya garg that's a-n-a-n-y-a-g-a-r-g $10 to $15 sliding scale. Um, and then I've also got these stickers that have my original art on them, which are $3 to $5 sliding scale. And just put your um, shipping information in the note and I'd be happy to send you a copy. Um, and if you didn't catch that, you can also follow me at Original Ananya on Twitter and Instagram and send me a DM and I can give you all the info that way too. Um, so this next poem is 
called Mango, and it actually is a poem that my friend Vico and I turned into a film that was showcased at the Northwest Film Forum's um, Cadence Poetry Film Festival, and that was something that was really exciting for me. It was my first film, um, and this poem comes to you in two parts. It is a prose block first, and then the second half is an erasure of the prose block. Um, and that basically means that I went through my own writing and removed parts. Um, and the point of that in this poem is to really showcase the way that sometimes beautiful things have some not so beautiful things hidden within them. So the way that I'll signify that we're moving from the prose block to the erasure is I'll do a snap. So this is Mango. Sun so hot, tables and chairs are steaming. Sidewalk too hot for ants to walk across. Bike tires melt as I ride in the back of a rickshaw. But right now, all that matters is the sun I'm holding in my hands. Rays falling through fingertips, juice dribbling down chin, seeping from hands to elbows. My mouth is missing a few teeth, but the fruit's fibers are caught between all the rest of them. I slurp every slice. The peels stack up until all that's left is the pit. Meticulously, I scrape every last bit of the fruit Hanuman wanted so badly he devoured the sun. My tongue runs over my teeth and giggles escape when I feel the funny texture of the fibers. There's mango juice on my nose somehow, my cheeks and my forehead too. I'm giggling for no reason, simply the delight of having a hot Indian summer afternoon quenched by a mango. Only if for one beautiful saccharine moment. These mango moments made trips to India worth it, almost, almost. India was always confusing, but these afternoons, I had my daddy all to myself, I thought. Me and you and mangoes, do you remember that? I tried not to think about the in-between parts, no, because mangoes had this special sort of magic. They let you escape into one glittering, dribbling moment outside of yourself. I'm having a new sort of mango moment now in a new temporary home, with new temporary people, in a new temporary place. I forgot how to cut a mango properly, and so a mess of irregular peels lie. The sweet flavor still lingers, juice dribbles off chin, rolls to elbows, tongue flicks over teeth, and I feel the fibers a feeling I hadn't felt in a long time. I had nearly forgotten mangoes and I had nearly forgotten my father. I forgot mangoes and full bellied laughter. I want to forget daddy. I think to myself, a statue made of stone, a plate of mango peels before me as if my devotees left them behind as offerings in exchange for my blessings. But my blessings, along with laughter, have run out. Sun steaming too hot, all that matters, the sun in my hands falling through fingertips, dribbling down chin, from hands to elbows, missing the fruit between all the rest of them. All left the pit. He devoured the sun, cheeks, forehead, delight, if only for one 
moment, moments, worth it, almost, almost confusing, I thought. Me and you and mangoes, do you remember that? Magic, escape, glittering, dribbling, new, temporary, new, temporary, new, temporary, a mess still lingers, dribbles, rolls, a feeling I forgot, nearly forgotten, I want to forget, daddy. Heels before, left behind, my blessings, but the blessings have run out. Thank you. Um, that's a poem that means a lot to me, so I appreciate you all listening. Um, I'm gonna read my last poem, so I just wanna really shout out the organizers um, and everybody for holding space for some poetry um, in the midst of everything going on and all the anti-Black violence that we're experiencing. Um, and I just wanna uplift that queer liberation means that Black liberation needs to happen as well. So keep on fighting. Um, I'd love it if you could send a donation to the Trans Women of Color Solidarity Network. They, post, they hosted a really awesome event yesterday at Jefferson Park um, and they deserve all the money. This last poem is called, In This World, You Are Safe. Um, and it's my blessing to the queer community. In this world, you are safe. In this world, you're not looking over your shoulder or jumping at the sudden loud sound. You're not running to hide. Nothing is looking for you. No one is asking for you, looking to observe your every moment, movement. In this world, you are okay. Everything is still. You are settled, not stagnant. You feel center. Your stillness is not boredom. It is stability. It's able, it's being able to rely on your environment, understanding that everything will work out. Everything is. Okay, you're safe, but you don't notice that you need to be safe. You live life and have space for yourself, space for others, space for making. In this world, you are safe. You are not running, you are not hiding. In this world, you have space to thank everyone who has ever believed in you, everyone who saw something in you. You have time to thank them all properly. In this world, you smile just because you can. You smile at whatever you want to, and so you do, and you laugh, and you breathe in Earth's air, and you breathe out laughter. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate um, the space and the time to read. Um, sending you all love. Well done. That was great. Congratulations. Um, hi everybody, I'm so happy to be among queer people. Thank you to the organizers for doing this. Riley, thank you so much for asking me. This is like the best thing I could be doing with this hour. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
I'm going to read, uh, um, okay, I actually made notes because I always forget that there's something I wanna say. Um, I'm Maryam, <clears throat> I'm from Egypt. Um, I've lived in the US for a long time. Um, I have a trigger warning for the things that I'm going to read today uh, in the second poem, Suicide. Um, and I'm going to be reading two poems. Uh, the first one is, a, is uh, I'm in a poetry class <laughs> online and uh, we got a writing assignment to write a found poem. I'm not in my apartment right now. I'm in Dearborn, Michigan at an artist residency where some people have left stuff all over the walls. Um, so I'm going to read this found poem that I, that I uh, wrote from all that stuff first. And then I'll tell you about the other one. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Actually, I'm going to wait with that, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is the title. <clears throat> Found poem composed in Dearborn, Michigan, where post 9-11 streets speak Arabic in the sixth month, if you wanted to start counting from when actually Chinese, not just Italian people got sick, of the novel coronavirus pandemic, and a few days after the fatal everyday shooting of George Floyd. A black man holding the wrong kind of banknote in counterfeit America by state pigs and Prussian blue, many of whom we must assume love their children. 17,818 days after the conclusion of the Stanford prison experiment, which lasted only six, day, six days out of a planned 14, which despite the truncated timeline, less than half of you've been paying attention, was still long enough to necessitate from every one of its voluntary inmates a hunger strike. Um, this is the found poem itself. Rhythm is the beat of life that saves you from the coma. Procrastinatory, procrastinatory cognitions. If there is any loss of service, to satisfy ochre hands, powder free vinyl gloves determining the inheritance. 20 years of forlorn hope. Bodies don't always know what's coming, you know. Mm. It's just your luck with the sea. Um, okay, this is the second one. Um, this is the one that I had the trigger warning for. Um, and the background for it is that um, on June 13th, uh, an Egyptian LGBTQ activist named Sara Hegezi uh, committed suicide in Canada, uh, where she had sought asylum after being uh, held in Egyptian prison, uh, tortured for three months, sexually assaulted. Um, and then she had to go. Uh, and then she killed herself, and then I forgot the very good advice that you should never read the comments. <laughs> so on top of mourning her death, um, you know, there was just like the spectacle of other people being happy at the spectacle of her suicide. And that sucked too. I'm going to um, share uh, my screen here. Uh, this poem is called While Sara Splits the Sea. Uh, this is Sara Hegezi. This is a picture of her that I found on the internet and that I was uh, <clears throat> thinking of when I wrote this poem. I like this picture in particular because it looks like such a nice day. And also because she has a gap between her teeth, but you can't really see it in this picture. So I feel like it has a secret. Well, Sara splits the sea. 
while Sara departs for splitting the sea. There's a guy named X and a guy named Y and a guy named Z who respectively A and B and C minutes after her untimely death by suicide, Egypt guiding her hand, and for the terminal good of the same, are explatificating, which is what you do when you've hit your moral stride, found the syncopated space of your outrage, and have taken it upon yourself not only to explain, not only to pontificate, but to explain and to pontificate, explatificate, to the iron birdcage made of screens, panopticon of us, otherwise known as the open forum of the world, the first ever incidentally to have been invented by an army, forums and armies traditionally being antithetical, are either raisons d'etre each to the other. That see but even let it go. The fact that she was a insert phrase, etc and that she was a, insert phrase, etc. And that she was a, insert phrase, etc. And that there, there's a rhyme and a reason verily for why the great snoozing deity made women from vestigial bone to be penetrated by the dicks of men who are born men with born dicks when they and their dicks are from woman born. Though that's not how you're supposed to say it. Not in so many words, of course, because it's not nice, neither polite. You understand to be talking about your actual dick when it's your actual dick in your actual hand that you're talking about. But anyway, سيبك من كل ده. Let us even suppose it, but for the sake of the argument, yes, easy. That this sorrow, even with her ways, the depravity of chosen target of all the love her newly forfeit body could make. People whose smiles for their and our shame should by all rights be dominable. Soured by our ancient acid wrung straight from the liver in the land of ancient river and yet they live. Digitized forever on immortal lips facing head on the bald face of a scalding sun, faces darkening in beauteous green grass life, in melanin resistance, in oh, the hurt of the indefatigable heart. Though it be finally appropriately fatigued, God's case won. يا راجل ده النبي حبيبنا قالها بنفسه وإذا بليتم فاستتروا Suppose again but for the sake of the argument that all of that were true that our all-knowing giant engineer God the greatest baddest Besh Mohandas in all the land had no special godly plan when first he made from the very start of time mind of holy mud first our fathers then from some extra ribs lying around our mothers of woman and man man and woman woman and man and what after all this time being ourselves, what, 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 what do you suggest? <gasps> Unsanctioned, expensive changes to anatomy. Joy in sex. <gasps> the dissolution of the family as we know. ايه قال يا بني ايه ده الشيطان شاطر why don't you tell me then could a chick يا بني ادم grow outside its egg could water reverse gravity يا بني ادم rain up the stepped pyramid يا بني ادم leave the base drier than the tip could cruelty be ever truly and forever vanquished in our father Adam's son's chests, greedy with, greedy with lust, puffed with dust? 
weren't proud knees made to kneel. So that fire on God's word healed to mud. And tell me, you revolutionary, you radical imaginary, you far-sighted messiah of, cure, of queer futurity. Tell me if perhaps you've covered this in your fancy foreign books. Could a hand by itself, ya bani Adam, ever clap? I look at Sara, smiling, and think to myself of the things I've killed off, not to watch them die. All my unspoken languages of Arabic, spoken, letter written, newspaper written, joked, dubbed. All the high school relationships gone. All the future of my childhood, gone. Every room that ever smelled of my mother, gone. Every room that ever smelled of my mother, gone. My father's gravesite, which is his father's gravesite, gone. Mango season, glory of August. The single uncle I like, who wears his pants very high, the occasional knowledge and exploration of the insides of my sister's family fridges, the bouquet of scents at the thresholds of their houses, aging somewhere close to my twin to see the strength of our ancestors' genes in the wrinkles of the other's face, reverse emergence confounding biology. Yahya and I twin gods, birthing our parents from our foreheads in the land of magic and snakes, where the river runs in its solitary direction counter to every expectation, and the airport banners of your return greet you with a lie, plagiarized from a longer lie. Enter Egypt and from harm be free. Uh, that's the second one. <laughs> Do I have time for one more? <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> yeah, thank you. The tears I don't get an option about anymore. <laughs> they just leak out of me. How, what else am I supposed to do in a world like this? But thank you for holding them. Thank you. Okay. This is the last one because I don't want to end <laughs> on just a note of rage. And uh, it is, uh, oh, can, is this better? Okay. Um, this poem is called Khushif, which is a uh, dessert that um, uh, we make in Egypt in Ramadan, which is the holy month. Uh, and it's just basically like a lot of dried fruits and nuts uh, boiled together and left to sit with each other uh in the same thing and then you uh put it in the fridge and you eat it cold um khushif. Uh, sorry okay my girlfriend, she says, you smell like jasmine. 
holding my lips apart, face propped up between my legs, breathing me in like I am some Provence postcard. Purple lavender running all along my snatch. My girlfriend, she says, you taste like truffles. Her tongue on my tongue, lips on my lips, breath stealing mine from my lungs. And I do my best to be the most expensive mushroom I know how to be. My girlfriend, she says, you are so beautiful. Grabbing of me fistfuls in her fists as if to tear me off of me, to put in her pocket for me. My girlfriend, she fucks me so that it hurts and I don't even have to fuck. My girlfriend, she sees me with eyes blinded by a magic I did not know I possess. I think probably I have it out on some loan whose terms I've forgotten, whose paperwork I've lost, whose principal and interest rates I couldn't tell you anything about. Best maybe not to find out. My girlfriend, she eats me like I am a Ramadan feast on the 27th night, a table of the merciful laden, lamb, saffron, rice, raisins, plump, kibbe, Spanish pinoli, blessed in the gaps between her teeth. And who'd forget tamarind? Sticky like fasting in the summer, moving slow, sour, sweet. My girlfriend, she eats me and then she spits me out, prune pits, apricot bits, and those crunchy seeds of fig from the river of Khoshef running between my legs. Maybe you think my girlfriend says, fuck, sees, eats, like a pretty metaphor, or like a scene in one of those butter-colored movies, all panted, all panting, Bronze, glowing sex, nary a condom in sight. But I must assure you, she fucks me like that dog you saw one time, or maybe like that monkey in the zoo a different one time, bearing its canines in unabashed glee. And I find strands of her long bronze hair in the crack of my ass later on. What I mean to say is, there's no poetry in it, only her hunger, which I will one day chew up, swallow, digest, deserve. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Spectacular. Oh, my. I mean, my heart to you for your voice and what you shared, your, your true passion. Yeah. Yes. I um, was at a reading yesterday in New York City and a similar experience happened. Um, a poet read a poem that was so powerful, so moving. And the next poet was Nikki Finney, for those of you who may know Nikki Finney. And Nikki Finney just said, you know, I need to stop for a moment and honor that space. So I just like us, we're gonna move directly to the open mic but I just want us to stop just for a moment, take a breath together, honor Miriam, what you brought as our final reader to close out our feature readers and bring this parade home to so many different places and lands and tears and feelings. And yeah, I'd just like to take a moment. And then I'm going to introduce Andy Taylor. <laughs>